we are getting Luke's overall theology, his picture of the intention of God in what Jesus Christ did. And he goes to great pains to tell us of conversions, uh, different kinds of conversions. Um, uh, chapter 9, reminder we're in chapter 10 today, but in chapter 9 was the, the big conversion of the enemy of the church becoming a disciple, an apostle, uh, that being uh, the notorious Saul renamed Paul. And um, this week in chapter 10, there are, um, there are a few conversions that happen uh, specifically. There's, a, there's this, uh, a Roman centurion named Cornelius. Um, uh, there's um, there's uh, various others. There, there's somebody who gets brought to life uh, like, uh, like Jesus did. Um, every time we see somebody the, 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 the people that we see coming to the gospel, responding to the gospel in Acts, it's typically something outside of the beginning point of Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter is the main focus. Uh, if you look at chapter 10, I don't know if you're looking at it with me, but um, I'm going to turn there in Acts chapter 10. Um, uh, Peter had just finished, well... How should I say this? Peter had just gone through an experience whereby he now truly saw the gospel as God's gift to the entire world. And that the, uh, the, the issue of are we, Jew are we Christians who are still Jewish or are we Jews who are still Christians? It's like it got answered for him when he had this dream around uh, the, the animals, uh, there's nothing clean, there's nothing unclean with regard to animals. It's all, you know, get up and eat, Peter. Um, be, being Jewish wasn't a big, wasn't a stopping point, if you will, for people to join this new community of faith around uh, Jesus. In chapter 10, verse 44, it says, while Peter was still speaking. Okay, now he had been speaking about how he had come to learn that, you know what? He basically says, God is, uh, th th this, this, this salvation that God offers in Jesus, I now, he, for him, he had a conversion. It was a conversion for Peter because he said, oh, I get it now. This is for everybody. Judy, uh, be, being Jewish uh, has nothing to do with what God wants us to what God is doing in Jesus Christ. Look at this. While Peter was still speaking, this is uh, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. What does this sound like? Yeah, this is like the Pentecost event of, uh, of uh, Acts 1, right? Now, one of the things we've got to keep in mind, that Pentecost event that happened in uh, uh, in chapter one of, of Acts that we'll celebrate next Sunday, on Pentecost Sunday, was an event of amongst and in the Jews, okay? Remember, everybody was in, uh, in Jerusalem for a big festival, right? It was all, it was all Jewish people, um, um, and not just Jewish people, but um, a lot of God-fearers, people who wanted to become Jewish but wouldn't, couldn't hear in this uh, passage in verses 44 to 48, we have another Pentecost, but it's not for the Jews here. Look at this. Verse 45, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Yeah, so um, these, uh, the, the Jewish ones that accompanied Peter were, are described as, as circumcised. And they are, what they're witnessing here is a Gentile Pentecost. Some people call it the Petrine Pentecost because once Peter realizes that God is uh, accepting of the Gentiles, that you have this event where the Holy Spirit actually comes upon them. And what is the manifestation of it? Look at here, verse 46. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. 
Um, a lot of people ask, well, what do they mean by speaking in tongues? Is this, is this the same kind of thing that happened on, um, on uh, Pentecost uh, Sunday? Or is this uh, what uh, some will call glossolalia, the, the, the higher, the, 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 the prayer language, uh, speaking in tongues of being filled? Probably is that. Uh, because we're talking about Gentiles here, and so that's what they were given to. That was a that was a part of that. That's a something that existed outside of uh, uh, of Judaism. So therefore, it very well likely could have been that. Look at this. Then Peter said, verse forty-seven: Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Peter had that experience of seeing that the gospel was for everyone. And here he is very clear that uh, baptism representing a rite of initiation, which is what it is uh, for us uh, uh, in the Episcopal Church, a rite of initiation, saying, why? how can we? How can we withhold that? How can we not accept them? That's what he's basically saying. How can we not accept them? seeing that they have already received the Holy Spirit. Remember, in, in our book of Acts, the many different pictures of conversion that we get don't just, um, uh, they don't paint conversion as looking at one certain way. Um, there are different ways that conversion happens. It's not a one size fits all kind of a deal. Verse 48, so he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. So uh, the baptism does end up happening. Notice it's, it's, not, uh, it's just being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, how do we do baptism? We do it in the name of the Trinity, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, this is just an example of how there was a progression of understanding of what baptism meant how it should be done, and to whom it should be offered. And this is an example of, uh, of that, uh, one of those stages, okay? Uh, later on, they get other, they get other um, uh, converts and different pictures of conversion. There is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all. Um, you know, when, uh, growing up in the evangelical world, as I did, um, uh, we were taught that, like, oh, you're, it, has to, it has to be, you, if you can't name a time and a date when it happened, then you're just not saved. Well, uh, the book of Acts paints pictures of progressive uh, conversions. Like, even though you think you've got it at one point, you get another view at another point. It's like, where's, you might ask this question, when was Peter converted? Uh, was it when he responded to Jesus to come follow him? Was it when he uh, confessed Jesus as being, oh, you are the Christ, the Son of God? Or, or was it here where he, um, where he had, the, had had that dream and saw that uh, nothing was profane or unclean for the Lord? Or is it here when he declares to everyone that this gift of the Spirit um, is indeed available to all, and, and, and he actually chooses to let other people in. There's no one-size-fits-all with regard to conversion, which supports our, our uh, way of thinking in the Episcopal Church because we don't force people into, it doesn't have to look a certain way. That's the reason why we baptize people uh, when we baptize them as, uh, as babies, and if they don't get baptized as babies, then, then they'll get baptized in a, as an adult when they choose that. But the fact is, God's spirit abides in us, whether we recognize it or not. This is uh, where faith comes in. Uh, faith is what allows that to make a difference, to, to, to allow it to make an experiential difference for us in the world. Now, this is, remember, a time when the, um, the Gentiles had not yet been fully included. And from this point on, it's like uh, uh, with uh, uh, Paul having been converted and then the mission, the, the, the focus of the book of Acts, now it really explodes outward. And it's all about, hey, we've got all these people coming that, that want to join us in our, in our faith. And it's decided that, you know, making people become Jews first, 
it's not so important anymore. This isn't, a, this isn't that time. This isn't kindergarten anymore, okay? We're getting beyond that. Um, this is the picture that we get from the book of, uh, from, from the writer Luke in the book of Acts. And um, I am going to move on now because I've spent 11 and a half minutes on this first one. Okay, the second passage of our sixth Sunday of Easter is Psalm 98. Now, Psalm 98 is a psalm um, which celebrates, if you will, the, uh, the victory of uh, God being recognized as God for, yes, even the Gentiles. And again, I'm reading it from the, um, uh, the Book of Common Prayer version, but um, I do want to point something out. In, our, uh, in your Bible, if you were to look up Psalm 98, um, a lot of times there's these, there's these little headings um, uh, that, uh, that, that give us a clue. This one doesn't really have, the only heading it has is just says, a psalm. Um, sometimes there is no uh, heading, but this is a praise for the Lord, a victorious ruler. Uh, look at this, Verse, uh, verses one, that's what, it's a 10 verse psalm. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. With his right hand and his holy arm, he has won for himself the victory. The Lord has made known his victory. His righteousness has he openly shown in the sight of the nations. He remembers his mercy and faithfulness to the house of Israel, and all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice, and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of song, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout with joy before the king the Lord. Let the sea make a noise and all that is in it, the lands and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord. When he comes to judge the earth in righteousness, so shall he judge the world and the peoples with equity. So the reading in Acts sets us up for this kind of psalm which declares, if you think about the attitude of the early church whereby they started to allow the Gentiles in and their, the barriers started to drop, this is about what in this, in the way the psalm talks about it, the Lord's victory, okay? This is the Lord's victory. This is what the Lord always wanted. This isn't a concession that, that, that God is making. This isn't something that we just discovered. This is what God intended all along. All openness that the church expresses is an example of the Lord's victory. And this is one of the things that I think we do a good job of in the Episcopal Church is uh, uh, celebrating uh, the ingathering of all people and uh, especially marginalized peoples uh, to the very uh, heart of uh, the ministry in our church. Um, shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands, because this is a victory for God, for everyone, there is not anyone that's excluded from the value of the salvation uh, wrought through Jesus, through the, the Jewish religion that, that was the beginning point of his worldwide salvation. This was just the beginning. His working with uh, this, this little people, this, this, this cadre of people in this part of the world was a, 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 just a beginning point. Um, uh, think of it like a, a pod of a, <laughs> you know how some people think of a, 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 a extraterrestrials, you know, and they're like, they, oh, they get, there's this pod and then they, they, they that's kind of like what Israel was. It was supposed to be that beginning thing through which God's love, God's salvation, the faith uh, in, uh, in, in, a, in a final victory and resurrection, would spread across the world. This is what Psalm 98 celebrates. Very good. Let us move on. I, ap I apologize for that noise. That's my dryer telling me that um, uh, the clothes are dry. You might hear it one more time actually during this because I don't know if I'm gonna get done before it goes off again. <laughs> All right. So, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. 
Now, uh, we've been getting a lot of First John here in Easter Tide, and it's been wonderful. He is just going to town on this idea of, okay, folks, if God is love, God saved us because he loved us, and if we're not practicing love towards one another, then how can we really say that we're with this same God? Um, I think it's an epistle that's a super reflection on what we call the great commandment, which is what? You shall love one another as I have loved you. You also should love yourselves. This is what it is a, a midrash on. I told you to Google that last week. I hope you did. It just basically means teaching on. Uh, so verses one through six, first John chapter five. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. Oh yeah, so he's, he's really getting to the thing of like, if you love God, you've got to love one another. There's no like, there's no like, oh, oh, I love God, but I don't like that person. Now, we might not think of it as like, of, as that, but we express it in our actions of, oh, we don't like that person. Um, you might not say that, you might not confess that, you might not even think that, but maybe your actions bespeak that you don't. We are how we are around people by the way we believe. And we, even though we might not say it, we might not be honest with ourselves, we might not truly, truly love that other person. Even though we wouldn't, like I said, we would never say it, we would never, never confess that, but yet in our minds it's like, eh, I don't have to love that person. I, don't love, I love that person a little bit less. Maybe not at all. This is, this is human nature, okay? What the Johannine community, Johannine, that's an adjective describing John and his community, that what the Johannine community was big on was celebrating the love of God in Christ. And if it didn't extend to the way it tr we treated each other, then it wasn't really, then there's just something, there's something amiss here. This is what our writer is telling us. Verse five, or verse two of chapter five. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. And for John, the commandments of God are all summarized in love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind. And thou shalt love the others as thyself. This is the ultimate of the commandments. There is no better way to explain it. John isn't getting at Oh, all these 10 commandments. No, if we get these commandments of loving the Lord and loving one another, then guess what? Everything else is fulfilled, everything. For verse three, for the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Uh, this is uh, something that we heard uh, Jesus say, did we not about my burden is light? Um, uh, the idea is not to weigh people down with more to do. The idea is to free us up so that we can love. Verse four, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. This is a, a kind of a description, if you will, if you, if you think of the way um, Jesus was spoken of as the word that the, that the darkness did not overcome. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith, who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? For John, this thing about conquering the world means to, uh, to, to actually let love flow, okay? Letting it out as opposed to uh, fear winning, uh, love winning. But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, for him, this belief, this faith is the key toward everybody experiencing this love which God has for us. Verse six, this is the last verse I'm doing, going and then I'm going to John 15. There's my buzzer again on my dryer. I told you we'd hear it again. I don't know, we might hear it again. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, verse six, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. 
I'm gonna go turn the dryer off real quick so we don't have to listen to the buzzer. Stay right here. Okay, John chapter 15, verses nine through 17. Now, in our uh, fifth Sunday of Eastertide, we were in uh, John chapter 15, uh, verses one through eight. And here we're just picking up on that same, um, that same speech of Jesus, only this is uh, following the first eight verses, like I said, of what we covered last week. Here we go. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses nine and following. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you abide in my love. Now, we had a lot of abiding last week. I talked about that before. The word abide um, uh, is the same word that means remain or stay, as in don't go anywhere. Um, stay where you are, remain, abide, live, if you will, okay? Um, this kind of thing. Abide, stay, stay, don't go anywhere. Stay in my love. Don't go to that, that thing which uh, which humans like to do, which is to like, well, it would be really fun to love like God, but you know, I gotta get revenge. Jesus is saying, no, abide in my love. Abide in my love, the kind of love that is willing to give up its life for its friends, as we've been told. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, again, so this is the John's gospel, right? The commandments love one another, love each other, love God, love each other. <laughs> if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. What have I said before about this idea of of something being complete. It's also the same word for perfection. Perfection is about completion, about, um, uh, remember electricity, uh, when there's a short in it, it's an incomplete circle. Well, here he is saying, let, my, let your joy uh, be complete. It will be complete if we keep his commandments. And it's a simple thing, love God, love each other. We didn't make that up. This is the command of our Lord. Remember uh, Maundy Thursday, Maundy Thursday? Uh, that's the day that we celebrate the, that giving of the commandment. So whenever we see John referring to the commandments, all he's talking about is loving the Lord your God with all your heart and loving each other as yourself. This is it, okay, for John. Verse 12, I'm going to verse 17, by the way. This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. And, okay, one of the, okay, yes, this is John chapter 15. But the words that we hear this Jesus speaking in chapter 15 it's very clear that this is something, I believe, that was revealed to a Christian prophet after the resurrection because we wouldn't really get how it is that he loved us by going through the death, the cross, the burial, the resurrection, and, and such. We wouldn't really get that where he says that you love one another as I have loved you. Does that not sound as though it's spoken by the resurrected Christ? I believe that the way John's gospel was composed, that a lot of these speeches we have in the middle, uh, in, these, uh, uh, in Jesus' uh, uh, teachings here uh, before, before the crucifixion, actually come post-resurrection, and that they are placed here um, as, a, as a message to the community as though he, he taught this uh, while he was alive. Um, I don't have to believe that that's the way it was done, but I think that's the way this makes more sense. It makes most sense um, that 
the, that the earliest church, um, when they reread what Jesus said, many of them understood it through the prism of the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. This is no different. Look at this, verse 13. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is what Jesus did. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, <laughs> but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. The, this is an interesting uh, uh, paradigm, if you will, a, a paradigm, a paradigm. Um, the idea that we are to Jesus as Jesus, as the son was to the father, in that we are that embodiment of him here on earth. This is something I think only the resurrected community can get. Um, uh, to be friends, to be called friends and not as servants. Um, uh, certainly we view ourselves as servants, do we not? But for Jesus to call us his friends is for Jesus to, to basically wrap us up and say, hey, we are, we are all one. And as I've said before, I believe this is the post resurrected Christ that is saying these words. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. We've had this, uh, this vein of thought before about uh, asking uh, for anything in my name that he will, the idea being, um, uh, we are all one. It's not as though we are supplicants of, uh, you know, of, of a different degree. We are something uh, which, uh, to ask in his name is to ask in us. We, he's like wrapping us up. This picture of divine union is what uh, Jesus is, is trying to give us. And um, we're the ones who try to continue to make separation there. When we see ourselves as separate from the resurrected one, that's when it gives us permission to be mean. That's when it gives us permission to be uh, naughty, you know, in a way of hurting other people, hurting ourselves. Bearing fruit, um, fruit that will last, it can't not come because we are one with this resurrected one. Sometimes I believe that we don't experience the bearing of fruit because that's not, because we're just not focused on it. And if we let ourselves see it, we will see it. Verse 17, I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Um, how do you love, how do you love purposefully? How do you love intentionally? Um, we are used to being told that we're supposed to love, but for us, we have to turn it into like, oh, well, how do you do that? I don't know how to do that, but what I do know is that we have to start by pulling down barriers that keep us from loving. Part of that has to do with how we identify with the resurrected one. Do we see ourselves more a part of him than we do a part of anything else? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times people see them more a part of their uh, partisan political ideology than they do of Christ. Um, I, see, I think a lot of people see themselves more as a part of, um, they, they think this cadre of humans that they, they hang around with, like, I, that's, that's more, that's, that's a, they identify more with that than they do with Christ. It's scary what some people do in the name of Christ. And I think it stems from 
losing focus of that we are one with Christ. And when we understand what Christ went through for us, it should give us pause before we give our yes to some group uh, and our allegiance or our loyalty to some other group. Um, our number one identity as, uh, as Christians is with this Christ. The Christ, like I said in my sermon a couple weeks ago, who has nail scars in his hands. This is who we identify with, number one. And if that doesn't uh, you know, uh, hold sway throughout our lives in all the connections that we have with other people, then we are going to miss out on the glory of what it means to be a part of his hand in the world today. And I think that the reason why a lot of people don't experience blessed lives and there's a lot of upset is because there's not a conscious, there's not a consciousness around the reality of, oh, we are one with Christ. We are, this, this union is something that uh, we're supposed to abide in. Abide, remain, don't leave it.